everybody. It's David Amber from Hockey Night in Canada. Forget about the first and the second intermission. The place you want to be, it's the third intermission. Did you miss us, folks? Because we missed y'all. And we're back. Uh, welcome to uh, welcome to the third season of the Third Intermission Podcast. Uh, this is your boy Dave here, um, aka Dave Sparnett on Twitter, Dave Sparnett on Instagram, Dave Sparnett on all that good stuff. Um, actually, no, wait, that's a lie. Dave Sparnett eighty seven. Um, I ran into some problem. I ran into some problems, but we're not going to get into that. <laughs> um, uh, you can follow us at Toronto Third on Twitter and Instagram. Of course, I got my boy. Avery in the cut here. Uh, we also got some heavy hitters, of course, including um, a surprise guest that uh, y'all might recognize. My boy Avery is here. You can follow him on Twitter at Avery, and you can follow him on Instagram at Avery Sports. Um, folks, he's single, so I mean, you can go hit him up in the DMs. But uh, Avery, what's good? <laughs> I am good, Dave. How you doing, brother? I'm good. I'm good, man. Like, yo, it was nice to actually connect with you at um, at TIFF uh, a couple weeks ago. Like, honestly, that was that was a lot of fun, you know, just, uh, finally got to meet this man. And like, uh, I gotta say, dog, um, you're really short. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no, no. The first impression Dave has. Well, I say that's, thing, I say that's a bad thing though. <laughs> yo, it's not a bad thing. It's like, yo, this man, yo, this man is a swift five, eight, but like, yo, don't, don't be fooled, man. This man will literally bum rush you in two seconds. Like, <laughs> Oh my goodness, that's jokes. But like, I, in I, all I, honesty, I embrace it though. I embrace my height. It, I don't have any any Napoleon syndrome about my height. I embrace being five eight. Yo, you know what you're good for in, in situations like that. Like, yo, say if we were in a WWE ring and I needed a manager, you have my back from day one. That is a fact. <laughs> Yo, Avery will do like the most bad trash talking, like nobody's business. Like it'd be like, they'll come up with like bare Caribbean memes and then just tell everybody to go go nice themselves and go suck themselves. It's like, yo, honestly, like yo, I could see Avery doing that. Avery, I could <laughs> definitely see you doing that. Oh, yo, that is, you know what? That could be a possible thing. I mean, you know what though? With with the NXT expansion, when they when Triple H launches NXT West Indies. It may have to happen. <laughs> Yo, I'm buying a ticket front row. Front row. Oh, man. Uh, I mean, if there was a hockey West Indies, which I know there probably is, and there needs to be some games yesterday for us, um, it needs to happen yesterday. And I mean, I mean, it needs to happen no. But, like, of course, that's kind of getting back to getting uh, honing ourselves back to what what we're what we're here for in the first place mm -hmm. and that is to talk hockey here at the third intermission plus uh we are a we are a hockey podcast but we are primarily a black hockey podcast which means we black we black we blackity black black and we like to keep it that way so of course obviously if you do feel uncomfortable about it then um and the words of our friends over black girl hockey club get uncomfortable because we're going to be here for a long time and you're going to enjoy it so of course, I'm going to try and control myself this season. I'm not going to try and drop as many F-bombs as much, but I can't I promise that. I'm sorry, Mom, if you're listening to this. I love you, but um, listen, I got to be myself right now. <laughs> um, all right. Anyways, uh, now that the out-of-pocket is kind of back on the airwaves and back on the airwaves for good, uh, we did want to talk about some stuff today. Of course, like I said, we do have a special guest coming through on the podcast. We'll definitely hear from them very, very, very soon. Um, also, we did want to give you a little bit of a sneak preview as the season comes up, as preseason is just about to get underway. And of course, we are going to talk about the beautifully done documentary over at the Toronto International Film Festival, which just finished up as of last week. Um, of course, I'm talking about the critically acclaimed Black Canadian ice hockey documentary done by, of course, um, executive producers LeBron James and Aubrey Drake Graham, aka Drake, um, and the folks over at Uninterrupted Canada. Uh, it was a very, 
very beautifully done piece and we're going to give our opinion on that very quickly here um we're also going to try and break down like how our saturday night went we're going to try and keep it as pg as possible and we're going to admit some stuff that we're not going to say on here um of course if you have patreon then of course you can definitely hear about our escapades from there but um uh just to just to give you a little bit of an insight um of course avery and i did end up meeting for the first time that saturday um of course i missed the red carpet because go transit is obviously on some nonsense and um dear metrolinks uh get get working trains sincerely your boy um but obviously you know i got there on i got there and i managed to make it on time and of course avery in all his glory with his fedora just popped out of nowhere in a nice cream suit and it's just like it's like literally an Oreo cookie standing out in a, in, in a sea of graham crackers. But like, it was just funny. It was just funny just to see him. And I'm like, here I am underdressed in a black shirt and a pair of Jordan ones, a pair of high top Jordan ones. And here's Avery out in a suit with his dad's slippers. And I'm like, Jesus, <laughs> like, why am I underdressed here? <laughs> like, but like, we, we ran into some, we ran into a lot of uh, like uh, a lot of celebrities and like, a lot of hockey, like a lot of hockey giants out there, didn't we? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we ran into James Duffy. We ran into Dave Cricks. If you know, if you, if you know Dave Cricks, he's the founder of Bar Down. But for those of a certain age, they know him as my man D from Cabby on the Street. That's what they've been known for. So yeah, there was a lot of heavy hitters. Um, we saw Four Corners as well too. Raptors mm-hmm. DJ. Like there were a lot of massive hockey names, massive sports names in general in, in Toronto. We saw um Colonel Car- Official, Colonel yeah. Official pulled up as well too to the movie like there was a lot there was a lot of people there to be honest with you like um say people representing black girl hub there was um a, a couple hockey schools there there was hockey writers there there were sports writers there mm-hmm. um a lot of toronto media there as well a lot of toronto and international media excuse me were there obviously not only just for the sake of the film but also for um for the film festival in general uh so like this this documentary did gain a lot of traction of course I had to tell the block about it. They want to see it in theaters and everything. And it's like, that's, I mean, that's the, that's the spark of a good movie. You know, if you're able to tell, if you're able to tell your boys and, and your girls and the man dem and the block on, on, like, about how good something is and like you actually stand it, then like, you know, like it, it's like, it's super important. It's super important to see things like that because there are not a lot of stories that represent people who look like us and be able to, you know, tell it in a beautiful way that doesn't make us look like we're trying to reach for something obviously we we can't give too too much away we don't want to ruin it um obviously you know there are some bits and pieces that like we would like to talk about and everything i mean there were some historic points that neither avery and i knew about which was pretty significant um there's a lot of funny anecdotes that like well things that we found funny um i mean if you're listening to it and you're listening to this right now and you're probably thinking like oh a guy threw on the uh, threw the banana a guy who threw a banana on the ice wanted to be a police officer said he wasn't racist i mean that like I'm, i don't know if you wouldn't find that funny yourself but it is what it is <laughs> so um there's a lot of there's a lot of it that needs to be broken down and everything um but avery i'm gonna open up the floor to you like what did you think of that film uh when we went to go see it that saturday like did you think it was beautifully done did you think it was like you think there was like bits and pieces missing like what's up i would say it was a very very well done piece and i love the fact you had not just nhl players involved in the movie but you had members of the media you also had minor hockey people involved it wasn't just a movie that was built on just the story of black nhl players you had black women's players you had like Mario hockey players from junior high school players. And that's important to make sure you tell a complete story. And I'm just one from an NHL lens. I felt that was great to see. Mm -hmm. And I think the significance behind it, of course, it was mostly chronicling um, Akeem Malou's recovery uh, as like, say, as like he was trying to get himself back into the game. Mm -hmm. um that was extremely significant as well um learning about the the now famous colored hockey league which didn't really get its didn't really get its flowers until the documentary came through and you know be able to bring their story to light i didn't even know africville 
was a village that even existed um, in Nova Scotia. Like that, that to me was extremely significant because like, like of course, Halifax is a predominantly, predominantly black city, whether people like to realize it or not. And of course, with the emergence of the Underground Railroad in the 1800s, or in the late 1800s, trying to like I fi- find refuge here, uh, up here in Canada, uh, during the times of like slavery in, in in the United States. And when you hear things like this, it's not only eye opening, but it's also heartbreaking to, to hear of such beautiful stories being swept under the rug. Mm-hmm. And of course, like not being able to hear everything because, um, for lack of a better term everything is just whitewashed and it's either swept out to sea where no one can find it or it's or it's buried under a whole significant amount of boxes to the point where nobody hears about it and then when you hear about it it's like oh get out of here that's bullshit i don't i don't get it i really don't get it and it's like why are we why do we have to wait so long to tell these stories you know what i mean yeah and it it it, it hurt me a lot when when i was hearing about stories just being snuffed out and then of course hearing hearing these beautiful black men and black women and black boys and black girls being called n-bombs because apparently white people have no better insults to call us but like like it really just ruined the whole experience of the game for us but of course as i keep saying that's why we're to get people uncomfortable and to tell the colonizers go suck yourself but like at the end of the day that, that's also why we're here we're also here to continue telling these beautiful black stories and make sure that we have fun doing it while staying true to ourselves and that's hey, all it is yeah and you see the movie i think the movie is going to educate a lot of people like there's things that you and i may not i uh, may not have known and there's definitely things like i'm sure definitely people who didn't know that black people have been playing hockey literally in Canada since the 1890s. That was since crazy. The 1890- Before the formation of the NHA or the NHL. Exactly. Before, like, and there are so many rules. And, and of course, now we're retroactively in the hockey world giving credit to the current hockey league. Because I remember growing up for many years, Dave, you never heard about the current <laughs> hockey league being given credit for goalies mm-hmm. dropping to their knees to make a save or the slap shot. Like these were never attributed to black hockey players. It was always attributed to guys like Andy Bathgate or Boom Boom Jeffrey on or Bobby mm-hmm. Hull. You never or shot like, plant. Uh, exactly. Like you like when you hear these stories, you're thinking, oh, okay, it was a French guy who did it, or it was a or sorry, it was a French Canadian or an Acadian player who did it. Uh, but you would never even think that like it was actually a, like generated by an actual black player. Of course. I do forget what both their names are, so I wasn't, I wasn't fully paying attention to that. But like, it's so beautiful to hear that, like, say, like you know, black people did it, black people invented it, and you know, obviously our work doesn't get credited for it. But once again, that's kind of how the story always goes, and we want to try and change that. No, of of course, and black guys, when you when people when people watch it in in more theaters across the country and hopefully across the continent, they're going to realize that this movie is very blunt. It doesn't, if you want a movie that sugarcoats the realities of racism, racism in hockey, it is, it, is, it is not for you. This movie is not for you. It gets very blunt on anti-black racism, anti-people of color racism in the game. And it shows how players like, um, you know, Nazem Kadri, Matt Dumba, Soraya Tinker, Blake Bolden, and um, PK Subban have gone through all this stuff over and over and over again. And it doesn't let you escape it, which is good because too long in hockey, like you said, Dave, it's been swept under the rug. This kind of stuff has been brushed aside and it hits you right in the face with no, you're going to sit here and you're going to listen to what these players have gone through. And we're going to try and figure out how to eliminate this going forward. Because again, this we've seen this happen time and time again. And people want to say, you know, it was just one person. It was an isolated incident. This isn't who the game really is. But when the game keeps doing it over and over again, it shows us quite bluntly that, yes, there is a problem in the game of hockey when it comes to those who are not white who want to take part in the sport. 
exactly. And there, there's, there's a lot of truth that needs to be uncovered, especially when it comes to the game of hockey. Um, of course, a lot of people are going to be upset by this, but it's like, you know, why should we have to, to take space when, when in reality, we deserve that space? To hear, to hear these stories, and then, of course, you know the backlash is coming where it's going to be like, oh, well, where are these guys coming from? Blah, 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 blah. They never did this. They never did that. There's bloody archive of that, not only in Halifax, but also in Ottawa as well, that has all of this information. And it's not like, you know, you can't Google things like this, because I'm pretty sure we have access to a lot of information as it is to this day. Like, the fact that people just want to, you know, be comfortable with what they just know, instead of being able to expand their knowledge and be able to be like, okay, you know what, this is, why isn't this, why wasn't this story ever told? Why did we never hear about this until now? You know, being able to question things, you know, that's what we need to be doing. And Mm -hmm. especially when it comes to this game, it's like, we need to start being able to raise voices more, question things more. Um, not, I guess, destroy the status quo, but like, I mean, bring awareness to what it is because, like, there has been far too many things that have been swept under the under the rug. Like, for example, sexual assault to women, sexual assault scandals in locker rooms, slurs in rock in locker room, racial and sexual slurs both on and off the ice. Yes, I mean, there is a fair bit of chirping, which I mean, some of it is like, okay, whatever, but. If you really have to use an ad like the other F bomb or you have to drop a hard R to someone who happens to have a different sexual orientation or someone who happens to be black or brown or Asian on the ice, that really just tells us that like, you know what, like you're not really open to giving us the space and that needs to stop. Because I mean, don't get me wrong, throwing hands is one thing, but like, you know. Dealing with teammates who have their heads so far up their ass that every time they crap, they eat they, they eat it. It's like, you don't want to deal with that after a certain point. I got friends who are like that. I got family who are like that. I don't need to deal with that. I don't need to deal with that when I'm playing, I'm playing hockey. I don't need to deal with that when I'm playing a sport. No. And even, even watching a movie, and of course, you know, just one of my last points here on, on the movie is that one thing that hockey has done too much, and this goes back to even when the Akima Lu news when Akima Lu story first broke was that mm-hmm. how, of course, people are saying, "Oh, he's making this stuff up. He's making this stuff up." And one thing that we saw again in the movie was that it didn't really hit on for some people until teammates also corroborated the story because teammates spoke out. Mm-hmm. What Bill Peters said to Akim was done in the locker room, and there were players who heard that and saw that firsthand, who said that yes. He did say this. It's a problem because when a black player, a player who's South Asian, a player who's who's openly gay, like any player from any other marginalized group says, I've been abused, it shouldn't take someone else to co-sign it to believe that. It shouldn't. It's ridiculous that we need somebody exactly. else to co-sign our trauma for it to be valid. What was that? that young man's name in like in the the like who played for the Halifax Hawks who had to deal with the who had to deal with Hockey Canada and Hockey PEI it was like Mark oh uh, Mar- uh, Mark Connors yeah yeah Mark Connors and he has to hear the n-word in a PEI hockey league like that's that's insane especially during like especially during a tournament and it takes them like what three months to deal with one issue and then five six months for the other to like not even be dealt with that yeah. really goes to show how much Hockey Canada really cares about the diversity in in, 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 in the sport. It really goes to show how much Hockey Canada even cares about whether or not they want to actually make an effort to fix things. Because I'm not going to lie, a lot of this openly pisses me off. Kids shouldn't have to go, go into these things, go into a league where they're going to hear the N-word every single, like every single second. You know, that's just stupid. It's extremely stupid. And like obviously this movie helped pointed that out on on like a massively beautiful scale. Mm-hmm. Well, a terrifying a terrifyingly beautiful scale. 
Yeah, and it's it's a movie where I wrote about it for the hockey news, in which every hockey fan, this is this is required viewing for every hockey fan. Heck, even even if you're not a hockey fan, yo you folks, be... do your homework. Seriously, you like this is the one this is the one piece of homework we want you to do. Watch yeah. the watch the Dion movie. Like even if you don't like hockey, like you should watch anyway to yes. learn about the culture and learn about what players of color go through in a sport. Because I mean, yes. There are great moments that they've had in the history of hockey. We have had great success when black hockey players beat again the Sarah Nurses, Soraya Tinkers, um, Darnell Nurse, um, if, um, guys like PK, the, the Subban brothers, mm-hmm. Akeem. Like, there have been great success, uh, but we've also had moments in which hockey culture has treated these players terribly and has to be faced head on and has to, we have to come out and say, we want this to change. There can be no more putting our heads in the sand because who else has to go through this over and over again? Because the cycle just keeps on repeating. And I hope people who watch the movie realize that we have to put our foot down and say no more for once, finally. And for what, un- for what Uninterrupted did, did, sorry, Uninterrupted has done a huge thing in terms of making this movie possible. And I got to give a huge... Huge congrats, of course, to guys like Vinay Vermati from Uninterrupted and mm-hmm. the entire team there and guys like Drake and LeBron, everybody else who wanted to be involved. Hubert Davis did a great job. He really mm-hmm. did. He significantly did. And like, honestly, um, Hubert, if you are listening to this, like, honestly, like, thank you. Thank you for helping create such a, such, such an eloquent story. Mm-hmm. And thank you for not only introducing such a such a, a powerful piece but also thank you for for your representation and your hard work because it's it's stuff like this that inspires us to grow the stuff like this to actually that actually keeps us going and you know like it's pretty badass i'm not gonna lie <laughs> so <laughs> uh, um i mean i think the one thing i did really find a disconnect on though was like say black media like say black hockey media as well um, cause mm-hmm. of course you have Anson Carter and you have Kevin Weeks, uh, and David Amber as, um, as of course, like say, um, uh, I guess black personalities on, on like on hockey media, like for example, TNT, ESPN, um, hockey night in Canada. Uh, um, and like, they don't get to, you know, be able to be their authentic selves when it comes to, when it comes to enjoying the sport. I feel like there there may have been a small disconnect when it came to that, especially when it came to the movie. But like, I mean, yes, it was beautifully well done. I just wish that piece, that aspect of of things was brought to the forefront as well. I think it was done more to focus on the players more. And don't get me wrong, maybe there might be a part two that digs more into uh, the black mm-hmm. media side of things because it's getting better. And I you're hope seeing, so. I yeah, really do. Because I'm seeing more and more, I'm seeing more and more black hockey media games to be themselves, which is a great thing to see. So mm-hmm. maybe there will be a part two of Black Ice that digs more into how the how um, black media is, how black reporters are in the game of hockey, because their story is important too, just as much as the players are. Because black hockey media is even more rare than the black players in the sport. Exactly, and you know, as long like I said, as long as there's somebody who looks like us in any and every given situation. Um, it allows us to be authentically ourselves. It allows us to be more powerful. It also allows for us to, you know, be able to have the space that we need in order to be able to, I guess, function mm-hmm. um, within the sport. So I think that's something that we need to look into going forward. Of course, things do take time. Uh, we just got our first black head coach. Um, we have a black executive in hockey we have someone who's basically taking low-income students and or like say low-income kids and being able to put them into a game that's basically so expensive of a make inflation right um you know it's it's things like that that really bring a significance to us and like i mean i'm trying not to i'm trying not to drop an f-bomb here i'm really trying today so obviously I'm being on my best behavior right now. So like, if it doesn't sound like I'm being myself, Breda, I'm being myself right now. Um, so <laughs> like you are being yourself. Oh, did you mean I'm black GM? Cause you mean you, you said black coach. We, we do have three black coaches in the hockey world right now. We do have three. Yes. 
Yeah. So yeah. Sorry, Mike I Greer. made a black GM. Oh, okay, yeah. Mike Greer, the first black GM of the San Jose Sharks. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, Brad, yo, yo, San Jose to the world. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> this guy. <laughs> <laughs> this guy. <laughs> nah. Uh, <laughs> but in all honesty, I'm happy that like, I mean, yes, it took 108 years to to get a get a black GM in hockey, but God damn it, it's about time. No, it's a it's a great thing to see, and hey, yeah. hopefully, hopefully we do get um, to see more black GMs in the sport, more black coaches, because we now have we now have black head coaches in the minor leagues mm-hmm. and in the, and, and in the PHF. It's a great thing to see. I'm not gonna lie, we we need a we need a better black leash jersey. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I love the Justin Bieber one, but like yo, that black and gold needs needs to go out like yesterday. Um, Shout out to Jay Beeps, though, and the Leaf Dem. But <laughs> um, as promised, I have a surprise for y'all. So, uh, like I said, we got a special guest coming through. Um, if you didn't already catch it, I may have just dropped his name. But uh, when we come back, uh, voice on the podcast. So uh, stay tuned. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the third intermission podcast. Of course, your boy, your boys, Dave and Avery in the building today. Um, like I said, we do have a big surprise for you. Um, and that will just be unveiled momentarily here. Um, of course, we do want to give our flowers to a couple people here towards the end of the episode. Um, and of course, we did want to, uh, of course, in- unveil, say, a couple new people on our roster. Uh, they will be around a little more often. Of course, one will be more behind the scenes and the other will try and, you know, spread his truth, as you would like to say, during the, <laughs> during the course of the season, but you'll get to hear, you'll get to hear the both of them at some point, uh, some point during, um, during our little journey here in, uh, on the third intermission podcast. Um, Avery, how are you doing right now? I'm doing well, Dave. I'm doing well, buddy. Yourself? I'm good. I'm good. I'm a little excited for uh, the little bombshell that we have here. As am I. As am I, good sir. All right. So um, as you heard earlier in the episode, there was a name that we did drop. And um, of course, that's actually what our surprise is right now. Uh, coming to us from the coming, coming to us from the mountains of hockey night in Canada himself and sports and sports net of course uh we've got the talented the handsome the the debonair the mr black excellence himself we got david amber in the building here uh david <laughs> uh welcome to the third intermission podcast uh how, how you doing uh, listen i've never i'm 51 years old i've never been called debonair in my life so thank you Dave. <laughs> Avery. I don't even think I've been called handsome in my life. So that's pretty good. I'll take I'll take it. Thank you, fellas. Uh, and Avery, nice seeing you now what, on the screen. But I saw you last week at uh, Black Ice, that great documentary. And uh, it's nice that we're doing this now so semi face to face, virtually, at least. Of course. No, of course. Of course. You know, David, hey, you know me had to be on, you know, the good, the good clean suit, the good fedora had to come had to come well prepared for the premiere, David. You know what? Yeah, you you on correct, point. man. Was it, the, was it, it was all white or was it red? It was white. It was right? all white. It was a, it was a yeah. all cream suit. Yeah, you yeah. pulled that off nicely. And it was after Labor Day, but somehow you pulled it off. It was nice. <laughs> Obama, somehow Obama it found ass, a way. You know? In all honesty, um, that was ironically enough the first time him and I had actually met in person. And of course, I did. I did get my shots in with him, saying like, "How is it that I'm like what maybe a good almost half a foot taller than he was?" But you know what? Like, <laughs> the suit, the suit just kind of just did wonders for him, and it basically covered everything. Like, honestly, it, it was a um, it was a very it was a very beautiful day that Saturday, to be honest with you. And like, a little bit of a fun anecdote for all y'all. Like, I was actually about ready to go introduce myself to David Amber, but. Um, Unfortunately, you ran off with your son before we could even say anything. And then we go to we like we go to get to our seats, and like James Duffy like literally a- it notices Avery within two seconds. And here I am, stunned out of my mind. I'm like, how does this man know know so many people? <laughs> Avery's out and about town. Avery knows everybody. I'm no- I'm noticing that about him. He's uh, you know what, and he's got the style and the look, and he people gravitate to him, so it works. Yeah, of course. Uh, Thank but, you, David. I well, that was a that was a great documentary, though. Hey, like Black Ice, it really it nicely was... told a, an important story, and it made you really think about where we are and how far we still have to go, and and 
some of the steps that have been taken, but it was it was really nicely done. Hubert Davis did a great job directing that film. I I couldn't agree more. Um, in my personal opinion, it was a beautifully done story. Um, I mean, shameless plug. I'm wearing I'm wearing the, the the Roots collection right now, and I have to say the the hockey hoodie that they have. This is legitimately one of the most comfortable things I've ever worn. Um, I would have loved to have gotten my hands on the jacket, but at the same time, I am not paying a thousand dollars when I got enough things to pay for right now. Uh, so, um, I mean, maybe one day, or hopefully, if they're listening right now, um, I take an XL. Avery takes a takes a men's small. So, uh, like, if y'all are listening out there, um, Roots, if you're listening, just uh, hook us up, please. Hook us up. <laughs> You never know. Put the energy out there, Dave, and good things can happen. You know, just put that energy out there. You never know. You throw it on the wall, you see what sticks, right? Right. Exactly. Um, you know, one of the goals is um a root sterner admission collaboration. So hopefully, you know, uh we get a little something down the road. Um Avery, or uh, so. Avery and I have a whole whack load of questions for you. Um, some of the crew w- did, weren't able to come through. However, uh, they did have a few questions they did want to ask themselves. Um, I am going to also throw you the few non-random hockey questions here and there. So, other than that, like you ready to you ready to get uh, you ready to have some fun here? I, I am. I am. I'm, I'm a little nervous now. I'm not sure what you're <laughs> this day, but I'm ready. I'll do it. I'll do my best. All right, sounds great. Um, Avery, the floor is yours. All right, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna say my question, my first one, David, for you. I want to ask you. I know you're you're I know you're a Jamaican man, so I gotta mm-hmm. ask you. And there's two Jamaicans talking about in Canada. There. There's you and there's Anthony Stewart. So I gotta ask, have you been able to convince either Ron McLean or Tim <laughs> Bietza to try um, curry goat, uh, jerk chicken, or roti or aki and saltfish? Oh, man. Oh, my okay. God. So that, that's, first of all, that's a great question. And it's true. My mom, uh, born in Jamaica, moved to Canada uh, when she was in her early 20s to go to university. And that's where she met my dad. And they actually moved out to Africa where they had my sisters. My dad was a journalist out there. And then they moved back to Canada, kind of decided to have the more boring life out of Africa. And they, uh, they had me here. So uh, and have been back to Jamaica before. And Stewie uh, has relatives there as well. You know what I can tell you, it was a couple of years ago, it was during the bubble, Ron actually, and I don't remember why he did this, but there was a reason for it. He brought in a box of, of beef patties for everyone to share. There was no, you know, you can't really eat like the curries and that sort of stuff. We're mm-hmm. on air, you can't have it all over your face, we're wearing makeup, you know, like I always have to like put the bib on when I'm eating because you know, can't go with the big gravy stains or anything like that. Um, but I would, I would guess both Kevin and Ron probably have had some jerk before. Um, and probably some curry as well. I don't know about the, the Aki's. I'm not a big Aki's guy, I'll be honest with you. My mom used to make that when we were kids. I was like, ah, just, I'm, not, I'm not feeling it. But, um, but yeah, I, I think they'd be into it. I mean, you know what? Maybe this is the year I, I bring some in and, and we, uh, before the show, like in our pre-show meeting, we, we kick some of that and see how it goes. All right. All right. So hopefully, Ron, um, hopefully you enjoy the seasoning. But uh, my next question is like, at least, from from outside of a hockey standpoint what would be like say the worst meal you've ever had while like literally in like say a different arena like say out of every single arena you've actually like done oh. done commentating in or like literally done an- analysis in what's the worst experiences you've had and please do not hold back <laughs> well that's a bad one i mean arena food is generally not the best i you're putting me on dave you're making me you're like now i have to like start calling out names and like <laughs> next time I'm I in mean, the, break, the chef's gonna be like oh so my food's horrible well i um, mean don't don't say toronto because like i like my 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 friends over at mlsc you're like oh it's not toronto. Kind of curious toronto okay. has a pretty good media meal um there are some places that that aren't quite as good i I hate to go down that path though. And I don't, I want to, don't want to be boring, but I also got to be careful what I say here. Okay. Um, okay. But there's, okay. but there's, you know what, most, they take care of us pretty well. And the media is funny. Like I'll make fun of the media. As soon as they hear a media meal, you know, everyone's like running in. Avery, you've been doing this. It's oh, like, I know. You know, yeah. I know what it's about. <laughs> yeah. Like it's hilarious. We, anything that's even remotely possibly free or underpriced, we line up and we're like, a, you know, like a herd to it. So it's hard to be, it's hard to be too critical when, you know, half the time we're getting these media meals for, for, you know, basically nothing. Um, but sometimes I've left there. Sometimes I've looked at it and I go, eh, I'm going to wait till after the game. So I'll just put it that way. <laughs> 
Uh, but we're, you know, I'll tell you some good spreads though. Uh, I was out at MSG. I was covering the, the Ranger Tampa East final uh, mm -hmm. as a ringside reporter and the spread in both Tampa and New York, specifically in New York was pretty phenomenal. We're in the under bowl there um, where they have sort of their, their VIP sections. And somehow we were able to just sort of integrate with the fans that are paying the big bucks. And, you know, they have this whole uh, buffet of food essentially pregame. And it was, uh, so, you know, you'd kind of do your pregame hits and you'd saunter over there and have a little bit to eat and go back a little bit after the first intermission. And uh, it was nice. That's amazing. And of course, now we know, David, training camp is starting up here this week now for all teams across the league. And for yourself, is the training camp in a way for you again, getting back to the studio? Like, what is it like for you now after a few months off to get back to it again? Do you still feel butterflies? Are, are, there, still, are there still nerves for you? Even though you've been in the in industry now for how many years and years? Are there still nerves for you starting a new season again, going into week one of our brand new NHL season? Or, is it, or, or are you past that now as a broadcaster? No, you know what? You always feel, I don't even know if it's so much nerves, but there's anticipation. Hmm. Uh, there's excitement. You know, it's kind of like you talk to the players and every player is like, this is our year. This is the year, you know, whether it's a team that's really rebuilding to make the playoffs or if it's a good team that's on the cusp, this is our year to win the Stanley Cup. And there's that like level of excitement and anticipation. And what I've said about sports, and it, it rings so true, and, and hockey's, you know, hockey's such a, a fickle game in the sense that, you know, Colorado had the best record uh, the two previous years, and we saw what happened in the playoffs, they flamed out and they underachieved and mm. it was so disappointing. And then this year you kind of go, wow, I mean, it's Colorado, who knows what we're going to get from them. And they go out there and they, you know, dominate what they go 16 and, and four, I believe, to win a Stanley Cup. You just don't know what's going to happen. It's the best reality TV. So for us as broadcasters, it's the same thing. I think you kind of go, it's, an, it's a new chapter, a new year. Um, you know, we always try to have some new wrinkles, maybe some new, you know, technology or things that we're going to bring to the table in the shows we do. Um, and for us, that's exciting. You always get a little bit of nerves when, you know, when the camera rolls on, just because it's, it's, you're like, oh, wow, you know, this is the moment, you know, and you always want to put your best foot forward. But I, I'd say it's like a positive energy. I, I rarely get to the point where it's like, oh, God, because as long as you're prepared and, you know, at the end of the day, we're talking about sports, right? We're not, you know, we're not saving lives here. So you can always just, it calms me down whenever I'm feeling a little bit of anxiety. It's like, all right, we're sitting around, we're talking about hockey. We're talking about sports. This is a, uh, everyone's escape. We got to remember that. And it, it kind of just calms me down and lets me just enjoy the moment. That's pretty cool. Um, this is coming from our boy, Troy. Uh, he couldn't make it this evening, but uh, he wanted to ask this question. Uh, you have previously worked for ESPN in the past. Um, is there a difference between how sports are, how sports in America is covered uh, compared to how sports is covered in Canada? That's a good question. Um, I was at ESPN from 2002 to 2010. I was a studio host uh, for about four and a half years. And then I was a field reporter. I was based in Toronto, but I was flying back and forth. I was rarely in Toronto covering any stories. I was always down in the States covering stories. Um, so I sort of saw both sides of it, remote and studio. Uh, I would say, first of all, it was, it was a real pleasure working at ESPN. It was really interesting, some amazing people. I'd say, if nothing else, it just might be the scale, the, the absolute scale of it. Um, you know, if you guys have got a chance to, to get down to Connecticut, get down to Bristol, Connecticut, get onto the ESPN campus, and we'll call it a campus. I mean, it's, it's as big as like Ryerson, well, formerly the school known as Ryerson. Uh, it, it's as big as many colleges and university campuses. If you go to a small liberal arts college, you know, you go to Bishop's University up in Lenoxville, Quebec, the ESPN campus is probably about the same size as the Bishop's University wow. campus. Just wow. buildings kept going up, the digital buildings and everything else. The scale of it was just so grand. The resources uh, were immense. Um, and in some respects, it felt like it was just very cutthroat. Um, you know, everything was, it was very serious. Uh, we had a lot of fun, but it just felt like big high stakes. I, I think in Canada and our overall approach to Canada is just a little bit more, I mean, everyone's busting their butt to do a great job, but I also do think it's a little bit more of a laid back uh, approach. Um, and I think when it comes to hockey, it's a little bit different too. Hockey, it's very sophisticated here in Canada. We're digging deep. We're trying to get as much analysis as possible. In the States, they still want to bring in sort of the, the newer fan. They want to cater a lot to not the diehards necessarily, but some of the, the average fans who, you know, know a bit about the game, but maybe aren't, you know, avid viewers every day. So we were sort of under, you know, it's certainly at ESPN when I was there, it was like, you know, don't get too, too, too deep. 
you know, hit around the surface, key on the star players and, and kind of be more on the periphery of, of everything um, and bring in as many people into the tent as possible. Whereas in Canada, you just can't uh, get enough information and the fans are so sophisticated. There's such diehards here that you really got to be on top of everything because, you know, if you mispronounce something, if you miss a stat, if you say something wrong, boom, you know, social media, you, your friend here on Twitter will tell you, oh my God, you did this wrong, this wrong, this wrong. So you just got to be so on top of things here uh, in the States. So it's just a little bit less catered to, to that, you know, diehard fan. No, of course, I couldn't agree more. You mentioned with the ESPN time. I know we got, I know we had the, they had the rights back to cover the NHL again after not having the NHL for 17 years. But what have been your, what have your thoughts, David, how they've approached their coverage? Because, you know, I thought they've done a really good job, not just, you know, having the big name guys who are there, your Barry Melrose is, your known, your Kevin Weeks, your, your known names, but they've also integrated other personalities. Like, what is it like for you to see someone like a Stephen A. Smith talk about Leon mm-hmm. Dreisaitl? Like, I think it's really cool to see ESPN use a Stephen A. Smith and try to make hockey more out there to people who watch, say, the NBA or the NFL, because I think it's so important, David, to get the casual fan down south hooked on hockey, much like you would get them hooked on basketball, football, or baseball. Yeah, Avery, that's a really good point. And it's funny, it was really sad when ESPN lost the rights in 2004, or gave up the rights, or, you know, didn't retain them after 2004. Uh, I wouldn't say it was a mandate to not cover hockey, but it was very much pushed under the rug. We very much were promoting the products that we had at the time, which were clearly NBA, baseball, and a ton of NFL and college sports, of course. Um, and, and, and NHL took such a back seat, really, to those sports. It, it was great to see hockey come back. And there were so many people who were so upset when hockey left, myself as well. But when I see the Barry Melroses, the Steve Levy's, the John Butchergrasses, and then they brought in some of the new faces, like you mentioned, with the Kevin Weeks, et cetera. Um, you know, I think it's great. I think it's fantastic. I think they have the biggest platform of any cable sports network in the world. And to know that hockey is going to be showcased uh, as a, a premier sport for them is important. And they did a great job. You know, it, they're, they're going to try different things and some things are going to be a home run and some things are going to fail. But by and large, their coverage was great. TNT's coverage was great. Mm-hmm. And I just think it's great to have more people and more broadcast entities involved in it. You know, obviously, Sportsnet, uh, we do such, uh, you know, a huge bulk of uh, the broadcasting. TSN clearly is involved in the game as well. But I think the more the merrier uh, as far as the broadcasts go. And to have it back on ESPN, the biggest platform in the States, is fantastic. Awesome. Um, This is going to be a little on brand for us here. And this is going to be a very serious question. So if you don't feel comfortable uh, answering this, we can definitely move on to another question. But... um, being black and being black in sports media, like obviously you've had your fair share of you've had your fair share of like struggles, trials, tribulations and everything. And I'm more than likely sure you've dealt with your fair share of, say, racist incidents when 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 you like when you've like broken through the industry. Um, how have you been able to handle that and still maintain your composure as, say, like one of the one of the most premier analysts out there when it comes to the sport of hockey? Well, Dave, that's a great question. Um, You know, I think you talk to any, you know, BIPOC person and they've had situations, whether they've been overt racism, whether it's been microaggressions or whether it's been, you know, people have unconscious bias and you might not even really know that. And uh, until, you know, something happens, a situation happens, you know, the way I was raised, my parents sort of prepared me for, You know, you're going to have to be able to handle some adversity Uh, the way you heard, you know, just like in the Black Ice documentary, you have to sort of fight through it. It's not always great to have to put your head down and just grind it through. But I knew, um, you know, I had to basically deal with whatever situations would arise. I I was, you know, very lucky to meet a lot of great mentors and great people to help me. you know, through difficult moments. And I had a lot of executives, um, you know, I met along the way who've been very supportive of, you know, my, my goals and dreams as a broadcaster. So I've been really lucky to be afforded some of the opportunities I've been given. Um, But, you know, you talk about the systemic part of it, and I've been doing this for 25 years. And I can tell you, it feels now there's certainly more doors opening for people who look like us than there has in previous times. You know, I would remember, you know, sometimes if there was 
you know, a black person in a position I aspire to be in, I'd be like, well, they've already sort of fit what they consider that role. And they're not going to have two black guys doing a show together or a, a black man, a black woman. And one thing I'll say is when I got to ESPN, you know, there was times when I, I look across and there's Stan Verrett and Keith Russell and Anthony Amy and, uh, you know, Daniel Sargent and Cindy Brunson. And there was other people of color, uh, you know, Michael Kim and, and Kirk Jimenez. And uh, it felt good. I was doing shows sometimes, you know, and there was two person show and it was two people of color, two BIPOC people. And I thought this is great. And um, it felt like it was being normalized. And, and it's so important, guys. And we saw this in Black Ice, right? Like when you hear from Trevor Daly or, or, you know, we heard from Matt Dumba, we heard from, sorry, uh, PK Subban, we heard from a, a whole group of guys there. And they seen the Willie O'Rees and the, and the Mike Ridley's and those guys, it normalized things for them. And I, I think from a broadca broadcaster standpoint, you know, as much as it wasn't always perfect for me guys, you know, the John Saunders, the Mark Jones, uh, there was trailblazers there, the Fred Hickmans. There was people there that I watched when I was in high school, when I was in grade school. And I went, man, someone looks like me, you know, see it, you can be it. And it meant the world. And I'm sure those guys had to break down a lot of barriers uh, to make it normalized, to allow people like me to come and continue their legacy. And hopefully the doors will just keep opening and people, you know, will judge us as individuals and not look at us in anything more than that and just judge us individually by our character and what we can can bring to the table so I, i've always sort of you know approached it that way dave is sort of there's going to be things that happen to you it's not always going to be fair it's not always going to be right but you can't let that defeat you if you're passionate about something and you're in love with something and you you know it's your calling it's what you believe in and what you know and what you're comfortable doing and your passion you got to follow that no, of course. I, I, I know, Dave, you're seeing, you're seeing more and more faces like us on sports TV now. And of course, for yourself, you're an inspiration, Dave, for so many of us who are in the industry now getting ahead or want to be get further ahead. And we're seeing now, I mean, um, last year, you saw with sports that last year, the Edmonton Oilers had numerous Black analysts on air from Sean Bell to Joaquin Gage to Sean Brown. And you're seeing in Chicago, Jamal Mayers is doing his thing. You have Anthony Carter. Kevin, uh, Blake Bolden, ESPN. And it's great to see because growing up, David, I didn't really see, I mean, I saw black faces in sports media in other sports, in basketball, football, but it was never hockey. It was you and then Kevin in 09 on Hockey Night in Canada. But it took some time to get a more continuous black faces in um, hockey media and even just people of color. So it's great to see now that we're seeing a consistent flow more so in TV in Canada, of people who are of color. It's great to see. And, and it, it's still coming more and more. There's still people who are younger than me who are in the pipeline now who want to see hockey media as a viable thing to get into. Yeah. You know what, Avery? And, and I'd love to hear you say you, you have no idea how many times, you know, I'm at the grocery store or I'm at an arena and someone comes up and says, Hey man, it's great. I'm really happy to see you. You know, my son or my daughters watches you and, and they want to be like you and they, and they, someone who looks like us. Right. And it, it means the world to me. Um, if anyone can feel inspired um, by that, that's fantastic, you know, and, and I think that's important. I, I think, you know, it's hockey night in Canada, right. It's, it's, it's supposed to be that fabric of, of Canada and it's supposed to look and feel and be representative of Canada. And as you said, Avery, for a long, long time, there was a lot of underrepresented groups. And, you know, what I, I love what we're seeing, um, you know, with Hockey Night in Canada, Punjabi, and, and there's a whole group of people who felt, you know, maybe this game isn't for them, or maybe there wasn't a place for them, or maybe they weren't welcome. And to sort of kind of get inside the velvet rope and be able to say, hey, come on in, come one, come all, you know, we're all a part of it. And to have shows look like the demographics of the people watching the shows, that's important. And, you know, we can't really underscore that. It, it really is important, the love of the game. And I think that was something, again, that they, they expressed so nicely in Black Ice. The love of the game has been there. It's not a matter of, you know, I, I think there's that saying, I love the game. Why didn't the game love me back? You know, mm. I think now more than ever, we're seeing so many people from so many different walks of life, so many different groups starting to feel embraced and welcomed into the game of hockey. And I think part of it is when they're viewing at home, and they're, and they're viewing on their phones and, and they're reading articles and they're watching podcasts. They see people that look like them and maybe have the similar backgrounds as them. And it gives them that extra layer, um, layer of comfort 
that, hey, this game is for you too. And I think that's extremely significant, of course. Um, when we did end up, uh, when we did see Black Ice on Saturday, along with yourself, uh, there was, I guess there was a sort of symbolism that really resonated not only with myself, but also with everybody else involved in, um, in the audience. And it was very it was very interesting and refreshing to see that, like, say, many people of, say, different backgrounds and different cultures were watching watching the film as well. Obviously, of course, because, one, it's the Toronto International Film Festival and everybody wants to be able to see a film. But also at the same time, it's like there's a genuine interest in Black hockey stories. Like, for example, I didn't know about the village of Africville. I didn't even mm. know that it got bulldozed and got turned into a, a, a rail yard in 1970 but that goes to show how how messed up our government is um i didn't know that there was even a hockey league primarily of freed african-american slaves in 1895 which i uh, which had me beg the question like why wasn't the story told more vividly and more more like vibrantly and you know it's it's like you hear so many things that have been swept under the rug mm. and there was something that was essentially said in the movie that really hit home with me. It's, it was the fact that we had to write ourselves into history just to get the space we deserve. And I don't like that we have to do that constantly. Mm. Where it's like, you know, we'd like to be able to be on the same playing field as say, um, those great players like Terry Sawchuk uh, or Jacques Plant or, or Boom Boom Jeffreyon or even Henry Richard, uh, players like that back in the day where they didn't even get the same respect or, or sorry, when black players didn't even get the same respect, like Herb Carnegie, for example. Mm -hmm. I cried when, when I heard what, um, what, Car uh, what Con Smythe said to him. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, that broke my heart. And I'm like, I wish I could legitimately go back in time and slap Con Smythe in his bald head and be like, "Listen, stop being a racist and do your thing. Do your thing. Sign this man. Mm -hmm. Let this man be the first black hockey player in the NHL. Mm -hmm. This man will more than like you win you more than at least thirteen Stanley Cups. You know what I mean?" Yeah, yeah, Dave, and I think that's that's a big part of it, right? The buried history and the fact that it's been sort of, as you said, brushed under the rug. Um, you know, there was there is so much history there, and I thought it was really interesting uh, when Hubert Davis you know, outlined in, in his documentary, the fact that, as you mentioned, the Colored Hockey League, it predates the National Hockey League. The evolution of the slap shot, it started in the Colored Hockey League. There's so many little tidbits of history. The fabric of the game that we're watching today, much of it was put together, you know, by black men back, you know, long before the NHL. And, you know, to lose sight of that is to lose sight of the true history of the game. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, you know what, the, the documentary made me think, you know, we've come a long way, certainly, from what Herb Carnegie had to deal with, but it also showed us we still have a long way to go. And I think part of healing all of this is to acknowledge all those people, you know, that were ostracized, all those people that were left behind, all those people that should have a rightful place in the history of the game that have been denied that history. So, um, you know, it, it was really... Uh, well-told and important storytelling. And it's funny, it's being shown at my son's school um, because I think it's something that could really teach a lot of people, um, you know, about the, the history of the game, stuff they don't know, you know? And uh, that's what I, that was sort of my takeaway. Um, but you're right, we, it, it's frustrating to see the tears in, in Herb Carnegie's eyes recounting after all those years, what he had to sacrifice, what he had to give up, you know, his passion, his love, for a game that just wouldn't include him. The pain, you know, you could feel that when, when you hear him talk about what he had to go through and endure. Of course, and like I said, there's, a, there's, there's just a symbolic nature behind everything. And it was very well, very well beautifully done. Hopefully, you know, this, this goes into theaters across the country. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, TSN is able to show the full, the full documentary or literally just split it up and put it on sports center, like, like for like a good five days, you know, I wouldn't mind that either. Um, mm -hmm. Apparently going to the barber shop and telling, telling your, your black barber, like, Hey, this is actually a good documentary. It's like, it, it, it's word of mouth stories that literally get things going. And 
you know, like when even though people who don't like hockey were actually like, okay, yes, this sounds like a great movie. I want to see it. It's like it is essential watching for black athletes or not even just black athletes, but just like, say, um, BIPOC, uh, people who fall in the BIPOC community in general. Um, Dave, let me interrupt you. I think it's I think it's must viewing for for white athletes. I think I think they I think there's more actually to be learned um, because I think a lot of people go, oh, come on, whatever, get over it. It's no big deal. I yeah. think when they see the pain in, in the eyes of Herb Carnegie or they listen to the voice of Matt Dumba, you know, mm-hmm. what the, the stories that these guys have had to endure. And these guys are living out their, their boyhood dreams, whether it's Matt Dumba, PK Subban, et cetera. These guys made it to the mountaintop, you know, PK retiring uh, today, uh, which was a, a whole nother story. But, you know, and this, some of the things they had to endure, I, I think, you know, with a little bit of, compassion and empathy I think it'll go a long way people going wow you know I again it's a matter of not only should I be treating everyone equally and and you know embracing uh the multiculturalism of the game but I also need to call out when I see something wrong if I hear a fan uh, an official a coach a teammate a player you know the environment has to be uh really accepting and embracing of everyone and the only way we be able to do that collectively is if, you know, the people who've been causing the problems understand the plight. So I'd say it's must, you know, it'd be perfect viewing for everyone, not just, um, not just the black community. Of course. Um, I got a couple of, uh, I got a couple members of the crew that actually wanted to come through. They just managed to get in under the wire here. Um, mm-hmm. I know you do have to go, ho- uh, I knew you have to go in the, in a few minutes. So, uh, uh, I got a couple of our sophomores here. Uh, Troy is kind of doing some parenting duties, but he will ask you a question really quickly. And of course, um, one of our other rookies from last, well, one of our rookies turned sophomores la- from last year, Dirier actually wanted to jump on and ask you a question. Um, Diria, if you can hear me right now, the floor is yours. Hey, y'all. Appreciate you having me. David, hey, appreciate man. your time and thoughts. Just sitting in the background kind of listening has been kind of quite a pleasure, so I appreciate it. Right, my pleasure, man. Um, I, I guess my question, you can take it any way you want to take it. I'm just fascinated because you've got an interesting space as kind of being kind of, I guess, in Canada, the most prominent, I guess, Black media member in hockey right now with a platform you have with Hockey Night in Canada, Sportsnet, your history, your respect community. And I'm curious to know for you, especially because the last couple of years have been quite hard with the news coming out, what does success and change look like for you in the next five years? Because I know it can look a lot of different ways. A lot of it is, it's great to have a conversation. It's great to have a conversation. I'm glad we're talking about it. I'm glad we're talking about it. In your opinion, what does a better hockey world a better hockey culture look like five 10 15 years from now well Daria, that's a that's a great question um to me i mean god there's there's so many things i can say here but to me uh you know we have a long way to go um i would say in five 10 15 years what i'd like to see is more bipoc people from the top down, it's always us having to elevate from the bottom up, mm. right? Um, and it's hard, it's hard to climb that hill. Um, what we need is some people who look like us at the top of the mountain pulling people up as opposed to trying to be pulled up, right? Um, and I, I think that would be important. And it can that you could that could go in so many different directions, whether we're talking about ownership, whether we're talking about general managers, we see Mike Greer now in San Jose, whether we're talking about, you know, presidents of NHL teams, whether we're talking about uh, even alignsmen and officials and head coaches, uh, all the way to, you know, broadcasters, uh, and obviously more players. Uh, I I think once we just have a bit more integration, and again, it'll normalize things, it'll get to the point where um, it just, it makes it so much easier to to feel space there where a kid can be born and go I want to play hockey and it's not like oh why aren't you playing basketball right I mean how who has who have you for hasn't heard that before right or a hey, wrong sport or whatever the case may be so I think from the top down it needs to look a little different feel a little different and that's when effective change can really happen um, and you you look at that and it's not just hockey you can say that almost about any field right 
Um, and a lot was discussed after the murder of George Floyd about what needs to be done. Uh, and a lot of these same sort of ideas were presented. Like it, it just, we have to be reflective um, and representative of the communities that are in the, you know, that are there in, in North America, in, in these other countries. And it has to make sense. Uh, and I think from the top down, it'll be just so much easier to have some of those doors open, some of those opportunities uh, present themselves and it'll be you know an easier path to follow if that's the case thank you very much for that question Deary. um so we have about a couple minutes left so what we're gonna do here is i've done this with almost all of our uh almost all of our guests here we're gonna do a little bit of rapid fire here we're just okay. gonna throw we're just gonna throw some out-of-pocket questions <laughs> at you so hopefully you enjoy yourself with this um this won't turn out like a like a, a night with Ray and nephew because I'm probably sure you know how that goes. So, <laughs> so let's have some fun with this really quickly. Um, all right, F favorite uh, favorite island meal, just just off the top of your head, bro. Oh man, uh, jerk chicken. I, I I get some jerk chicken every now and again. Rice and peas, jerk chicken. Out of boy. <laughs> yeah. Right, I love rice and peas. My mom used to right. shave the coconut and everything. Was great. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, Avery, you got one for him, don't you? I do, yes. I got an um, upcoming season question for you, David. Which team is going to be your dark horse to succeed? And which team takes a step back in the playoffs? Which team do you think misses the playoffs that made it last year, David? Okay, oh my God. I've got to, I've got to jar my memory here. Hold on. I'm just <laughs> popping open. I, He's fully out his notes, folks. You caught me after a long day. Um, <laughs> team that could slide a little bit. I could see, I could see... Carolina sliding a little bit. I can see LA on the way up. I still like Minnesota too, though. I, I Minnesota, I think, is a sneaky good team. Gary, you got a quick question for him? No, I'm just making notes. I'm just making notes so I can bother him on Twitter in six months. That's <laughs> you bother me anytime, man. Got you. Mini up. All right, got you. <laughs> um, best city to visit? Oof. You mean like a hockey city? No, just best city and uh, best city in general. Oh my God, man! Well, I mean, Italy, I told you, <laughs> places like Florence in Italy. I, Hawaii's not a city. I realize that, but you know, going to Maui is it's hard to beat that. Um, I don't know. There's so many. My God, I've been down to Rio. Rio is pretty amazing. Yeah, there's so many good ones, man. So many good. Those three jump to mind, though. Um, Air Forces, Jordans, or dress shoes. Oh, definitely not dress shoes. I actually have LeBrons. My son's <laughs> big into Jordans, but I have a, I have a few LeBrons. Okay, okay, yeah. not bad. Um, Ray and nephew or Appleton? If there were literally two bottles right in front of you, what would you go for? Probably Appleton. But <laughs> I'm not the biggest rum guy. I'll be honest. I'm more of a tequila guy. I don't know. <laughs> okay, um, Patron or Don Julio? Or even <laughs> uh, probably Patron, I think. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, if we ever get famous enough, we'll send you a bottle just 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 for helping <laughs> us out. Um, Troy, you got a rapid fire question for him, really quick. Hi, David. Hey, uh, quick question. Doing? Yeah. Not too bad. How are you? When yeah. you guys were doing the Zoom calls during the pandemic on Hockey Night in Canada, what's the strangest photo Kevin BX I had behind him? Ooh. What's the strangest photo he had behind him? Yes, there were like little Easter photos. eggs every Saturday night. I don't know where he came up with these ones. I, he was like doctoring them. He had these crazy pictures of Elliot. I didn't know what the heck was going on. I was just getting nervous, right? I think he had one of me, but it was like off a little bit. So I was, didn't get a lot of play, which was good. He had some weird <laughs> ones though, man. Yeah, I don't know where he was pulling. He had a crazy one of Stewie. I think when Stewie was, I don't know, like 16 or something. He had a whole bunch of wild ones. The ex is a, he's a wild man. You got to keep an eye on him because you don't know. And you don't want to get in one of these battles with him because he'll take it right down into the sewer and you'll be in trouble. He worries me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw the one where I think it was Ryan Kessler and the body issue behind him and Ben Haley's like, what, what's happening behind you right now? Why do you have a picture of a naked man behind you? That was hilarious. Yeah, Ryan. Well, he, he's always taking the piss out of Kessler. But Kessler and him are really good friends and Corey Perry and him are really good friends. So he's always just giving it to those two. He's uh, Kevin's got a really good, sharp uh, sense of humor. It's always fun working with him. Who has a nicer house? Um, Anthony Stewart or Kevin Weeks? <laughs> I haven't been to Stewie's house, but I've I'm been. 
Stewie, I mean, every time I talk to him, you've been there. So every time I talk to Stewie, he's having another kid. So he's probably but like a compound. I'm sure it's amazing. I've been to Kevin Lee's house. I think it was his old house though. And it was very nice too. I would say, I was, we'll call that a tie. I'm sure that's a tie because those guys both, they, they do it right. Last question. Uh, last question for the group. And like, this is me being out of pocket. Where's the worst place to get a nice fresh fade or a nice lineup? Like when you're doing your hockey travels. Oh my God. So that, that can be a struggle, man. And thank God, like there's not a hockey team in Utah or something, but um, <laughs> uh, I, uh, see, that's the thing. Like I get mine up at uh, Oakwood and Eglinton. I got my guy Crasher up there and, and listen, he used to have more work than now. Now it's just cleaning up the mess really. But um, yeah, there's been some bad, I Tampa, I had to go on a bit of a trek during the uh during the playoffs Colorado I had to go on a bit of a track just not knowing right so you got to like type in best black barber near me or something so, uh, New York was in trouble New York was easy uh, okay. yeah I'd say like Utah would worry me <laughs> <laughs> that's well, the best answer we've got <laughs> well let me tell you something David though Edmonton you'll be good Edmonton, you'll be all right for a for black barber shops. Edmonton oh, is good for that. Yeah, for black Edmonton's barbers. got some spots. I've gone there before, actually. Yeah, um, it's okay. I thought, yeah, I got one there during the Battle of Alberta this year. If you ever cover a CHL game and say, lo and behold, Memorial Cup ever gets covered in Kitchener again, um, I got a barber for you too. So like, yeah, I, got nice. you. I got you. I got you. Um, so we know you have to go. Um, we kept you a little bit past your um past no your time problem. here. But honestly, we we were very happy to have you come through. Back on later in the season when we get through, you know, halfway through the season where we could talk a little hockey and have a little mix of hockey and social issues. Of course. Um, hopefully, you know, if you're ever doing a game in Toronto and say we ever get invited to one, um, we'd like to just sit down and chat, for, like, say, when you have a chance and, you know, talk a little puck, talk a little social issues, maybe get a prime rib sandwich if, if you eat beef. But... <laughs> But well, sounds uh, good, Dave. I, listen, I appreciate guys having me on and uh, best of luck with the podcast and uh, you keep, keep grinding it out, fellas. You're doing a good thing. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. Um, awesome. Thank you for coming through, David. Uh, all the best to you at Hockey Night in Canada. Um, please make sure that you take pictures of Ron McClain eating oxtail because that's all we need right now. <laughs> that's all we need. We need it for the gram. We need it for the Twitter. Like we need it for everything just for our souls, you know, just, 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 we need all of it. All, all right. right. Some in. I'll do that. All right. All right. Thanks, all right, David. Take it easy. Be well, guys. You too. All right. So, um, of course, that was our surprise. Uh, the well, one of the one of the pillars of Black Excellence in Hockey, aka the Suave Debonair, handsome, uh, all around, all around Badman. Uh, David Ember came through in the cut today. Um, very excited about that. And of course I didn't embarrass myself like I did with George rock last season. So that was also a plus. Um, but other than that, uh, for the crew here, for my boy, Troy, for my boy, Deerier, and of course, um, Mr. Studio girl, AKA the Mr. Fedora man himself, uh, Avery, this is your boy, Dave signing off. Uh, give us a follow, give us a listen, follow us on the socials, follow us on the, follow us on the platforms. We ain't stopping. We're coming. Dude.